the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. In the past two weeks, the news out of Rome has not been good. It's been terrible. And uh, while some of it was anticipated, uh, some was not, and some is even worse than many imagined. Much of the news about the Synod is not good. It is now known and widely reported that among other things there have been pagan idols, idols, and pagan rituals, including pagan witches and priests and priestesses, uh, displaying these pagan idols and having pagan rituals in Rome, in Catholic churches in Rome, and even within the Vatican itself. Imagine that. Pagan idols, pagan religious rituals right within the church herself. We are also told, though much of the discussions are kept secret, that there has been the anticipated push for the ordination of women and for the ordination of married men, at least within the region of the Amazon. We are also being told that there is a recommendation that Catholics will need to start confessing sins against ecology. And let me tell you now, please do not come into my confessional and confess how many carbon footprints you have left wherever you have gone. I will assign you one Hail Mary for every carbon footprint that you confess in the Holy Sacrament. Beyond the Synod, and during this same two-week period, it has been widely publicized that an Italian journalist published uh, words of an interview that he alleges to have had with Pope Francis, in the course of which he alleges at least, and attempts to quote, or at least closely repeat, what Francis said, to the effect that Francis denies that our Lord Jesus Christ, throughout his time here on earth, denies that he was divine. Hear that again. This uh, journalist alleges that Pope Francis told him quite clearly that Francis does not believe Jesus Christ was divine while here on earth. What is startling in addition to that allegation is that Pope Francis has made no attempt to publicly deny that uh, allegation that has now been published worldwide. And even the Vatican responds to it was not a explicit denial as such. It was a statement to the effect that, uh, well, the words of this uh, journalist may not be reliable. I'm telling you, if any one of you or any journalist or anyone claimed that I, in any manner, denied the divinity of Christ, I would be shouting it from the roof of this church that I firmly profess and believe that Jesus Christ was and is divine. And during this two-week period, it is now being reported by at least some sources that there has been a police raid within the Vatican and that apparently there has been uncovered some sort of major financial scandal to the tune of upwards of a equivalent of a half a billion dollars that may involve Peter's Pence, which is a collection taken up from 
churches worldwide and entrusted to the Vatican and to the Pope to help in particular the church in poor places and poor countries that upwards of a half billion dollars has been badly misused uh, and fraudulently used other than for its purpose. And at least one cardinal and some bishops and other high-ranking Vatican officials are under investigation for that right now. So in light of the news of even the short span of two weeks, I want to speak briefly about three aspects of the church or three things that are related to the life of the church. Inerrancy, infallibility, and indefectibility. And very briefly, I want to begin with uh, inerrancy. Inerrancy literally means without error. And in the life of the church, that is applied to sacred scripture, the Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament. The church firmly teaches, as does sacred scripture itself, that uh, sacred scripture is completely without error, without exception. Now, we do not have any of the original writings of the Old Testament or the New Testament in our possession. We have manuscripts and copies. There can be errors in copies. There can be errors in translations. But as to what St. Paul and St. Luke and St. Matthew and um, St. John and Moses and others wrote themselves, their writings are absolutely without error, no exception. And we know this not only because the church teaches it, but would follow from the fact that all scripture is inspired by God, it is God's word, and God cannot be guilty of error. God would never mislead us in error. Now, most modernist scholars and modernists in general reject this and do not even look upon the Bible as inspired. They look upon it as a piece of religious literature comparable to the writings of the ancient Near Eastern texts and the Quran and uh, others. But modernists do not accept inerrancy. But that is a teaching of Scripture and the Church, and it applies to sacred Scripture. Now, another area of church life is with regards to infallibility. Infallibility does not mean that every single word of something is without error as such, as is God's word that is directly willed by God. Infallibility is typically applied to some doctrinal truth that has been revealed and uh, that it cannot in the truth itself fall from the truth. Now, let's distinguish what's uh, infallible and what is not. Um, my sermon is not infallible. I sometimes probably act like what I say is, but I'm not infallible. And even guided by the Holy Spirit, as I hope in preaching, my sermon and what I say is not guaranteed to be free of error. And I'll prove it to you. Two plus two is 95. That's not true. And even if I try and declare it so, I solemnly declare and teach and bind you to believe that two plus two is 95. It is an error. It is not true. So the preaching of pastors is not something infallible. Well, how about moving to other areas of church life? How about a catechism? Is a catechism infallible? 
I would say no. I'm not aware of any formal declaration by the Church that catechisms are infallible. Catechisms are collections of what we believe, of what the Church teaches. And to the degree that they accurately represent that truth, or those truths, then they do not fall from the truth. But there is no guarantee of infallibility for any particular catechism. And I'll give you an example. Most recently, an addition has been made to the Catholic Catechism, which reads this about the death penalty. And this was an addition put there by Pope Francis. The Church teaches, in light of the Gospel, that the death penalty is inadmissible because it is an attack on the inviolability and the dignity of the person. And she works with determination for its abolition worldwide. Now the difficulty with that statement is it makes the death penalty out to be something intrinsically evil, meaning it always is and always has been. Then the Church would have been in error for having taught that the death penalty can be permissible. And the Old Testament would be an error where God himself even commanded uh, executions uh, for certain crimes. And even in light of the gospel of this very Mass, listen to this parable that Jesus Christ, fully divine while here on earth, here's a parable of today's Mass. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Burned their city. If capital punishment is intrinsically evil, as the Catechism now reads, and as Pope Francis now insists that the Church teaches, how in the world could Jesus Christ use as a parable an example of slaying these individuals who had taken the lives of the servants and burning down their cities? I mean, even in its present form, I've never heard in the United States of America, for instance, of an execution in which we not only execute the criminal, but go to wherever he lived and burn down that city. No, catechisms are not infallible. How about councils? Are councils infallible? Not unless they declare themselves to be on particular points. Even Pope Paul VI himself indicated that the Second Vatican Council was not dogmatic. It was Pastoral, but let's look at one example that clearly cannot be an infallible teaching that comes out of the Second Vatican Council, in which we have this statement. The Church also regards with esteem the Muslims. They adore the one God, living and subsisting in himself, merciful and all-powerful, the creator of heaven and earth. Do they really adore the one God that is the same God that we adore? A true Muslim would be the first to try to put you to death for making that claim. They do not worship the one true God. They're monotheistic. They happen to believe in one God, but it's not the one God living and true and subsisting in himself. In fact, here is one statement from their holy book, in their minds, the Quran. I read this in light of an incident that happened this past week, or it was reported this last week, where a husband cut off his wife's nose 
A Muslim husband cut off his Muslim wife's nose because she wouldn't make him a cup of tea. Oh, and he had to have his brothers help him to beat her when he did this. Well, he's following the Quran of that uh, one God that they worship, in which it reads, Men have authority over women because Allah has made the one superior to the other and because they spend their wealth to maintain them. Good women are obedient. As for those from whom you fear disobedience, admonish them and beat them. I've never read that in sacred scripture. No, councils in general are not infallible unless they determine that they intend to be, and you will know it. It will be formalized, it will be declared, and it may even be put into a creedal statement, such as the Council of Nicaea has given us the Nicene Creed, which we will recite shortly. Are popes infallible? Rarely. Rarely do they exercise this charism. Many would say that in the last two centuries it's only been exercised twice. Perhaps that can be debated, but notably for the declaration of Mary as the Immaculate Conception and then uh, the declaration of her assumption, both Marian uh, statements. But are popes infallible in much of what they say or most of what they say? Well, not necessarily. And if Pope Francis did, in fact, say what he said to this journalist, or if he even believes it, but has not said it to that journalist or to anyone, if he said it, if he believes it, he's not Christian. He's not Catholic. He is an apostate. And I say that in general about anyone who is baptized, who subsequent to that does not believe in the divinity of Christ or professes against the divinity of Christ. It's incompatible with Christianity. It's so core to Christianity. So anyone who does not believe in the divinity of Christ is not Christian, whether or not it's professed. And any baptized Christian, Catholic or otherwise, who does not believe in the divinity of Christ is an apostate, even if not known. Now, it's another matter as to whether or not Pope Francis says this, I do not have the means or the authority to determine that. And I leave it to God in his providence, overlooking the church. If he so desires to raise up in grace those with authority, namely cardinals, bishops, to at least ask the question, if not to more formally find a means to discern this and act upon it, but that's how serious, by the way, that uh, alleged statement is. It's that serious. You cannot be Christian, you cannot be Catholic, if you do not believe in the divinity of Christ. And I will take it one step further. If Christ was not divine while he was here on earth, then we are fools, and we are damned, and I mean damned, we are still condemned to hell. Because there is no one, no person, no human person, no super eminent person, no angel, not even the seraphim, not all of humanity together, not all of the angels combined can save one soul that has been condemned for sin. That could only be done and has only been done by one. God himself incarnate in the flesh, Jesus Christ. 
fully God, fully man. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.